So my guest today is Jim Rink, an ex-manufacturing professional who spent his career in various senior leadership roles with Fortune 50 organizations, particularly a Fortune 50 heavy equipment manufacturer. In the second half of his career, he's focused on helping organizations execute higher levels of performance while ensuring the individual team members are fully engaged and committed to the organization's success because we know so many people are not really engaged at work. Jim, how are you? Welcome. Wow. Jeff, you are a ball of fire. So thank you for inviting me on today. You're very welcome. So let me just start off with the obvious question for half the people in the United States. Why the heck would someone want to go into a job in manufacturing? Like, aren't these a bunch of people who sit around the trailer park and uh, drink beer all night and uh, it, they get dirty during the day? It, it's kind of like working in the mines. Is that really what it's like? Mm, I, I some places I'm sure are still like that. I'm sure they're still like that, Jeff, but um, where somebody lives, I don't know. But I would tell you that uh, the U.S. economy is, is still, people don't know this, it's still, uh, I've got, I actually got some stats over here. It's about 11.4% of the total gross product in the United States is still in manufacturing. So it's, it's a $2.3 trillion annual industry. And it's a lot more high tech than you think it is. And I think it's a place I spent 30 years of my life and I miss it every day. Interesting. So when you say high tech, what form does the tech take? Oh, see, tech can be everything from um, advanced computers, uh, machine tools today. You know, again, when like maybe somebody took shop class in the, in the 80s, they did a little engine lay, then they dialed the thing in. Today, those, those machine tools are adjusting themselves for temperature. They're adjusting themselves for humidity. Um, the, factory today the machine you know the air conditioning unit is talking to the machine tools the machine tool gets hot it, it'll adjust the air conditioning in the facility open close vents um, probably one of the biggest challenge for manufacturers is talent and it's not just bodies it's it's people with the ability to learn and ability to take on new things and thus the definition of talent that they're looking for and I know it's very wide because one one place can look for something different than another place. Right. But if you were to generalize what your definition of talent is, well, how would you do tell that? You, okay, so it's a person who's, like, let's say maybe 30 years ago, 40 years ago, number one trait was probably good attendance, right? That's what I, I think a lot of people see uh, an and They didn't steal and anything. Attendance. And they, well, yeah, they are only stole a little bit. Uh, but the, uh, yeah, I think those attendance would have been a, a really key factor. People got promoted because they were present. Today, it's computer skills. It's the ability to learn. It's abilities to, you know, critical thinking. Dependability is still in there, right? Because uh, manufacturing, one of the coolest thing about manufacturing is it's a team environment. Um, the thing I miss the most is the sense of camaraderie. I, I was not a military person, but when you talk to people about what they miss from the military, they miss being part of a, of a unit. They miss being part of a team. I miss being part of my community and, and being involved with people daily. So enthusiasm, good attitude, but, uh, but really an ability to learn. And what sort of things are people asked to learn? Well, a lot of machine tools are complex. You know, uh, you, you, you joke about, or not joke about, but we'll talk about like a uh, Air Force pilot or a Marine pilot is flying a, you know, billion dollar aircraft. Machine tools, a machine tool setup could be four or five million dollars in a small setup. A uh, big pro uh, process line in a chemical plant might be hundreds of millions of dollars. So you don't like turning people loose who are just winging it. You know, you don't want just button pushers. You want people that really have a sense of understanding what's going on and then just aren't trying to wing it as they go. It takes a lot of deep understanding to run machine tools today. So when I think about an org structure within a plant, there are people who do stuff, there are people who manage people who do stuff, and there are people who lead everyone else and think about the best way things are done. Right. Uh, I, I know that's a great simplification, but it seems to work in most organizations. I'd be surprised if manufacturing was much different. So when I think in terms of people who do stuff in the typical plant, 
what sort of stuff do they tend to do on a daily basis? Well, you're, 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 uh, again, if you look at a model that's often used in like, the, uh, you call it operational excellence, uh, lean manufacturing operational excellence, is the, is the person on the shop floor is like the center of, the, of surgery, right? You know, we try to design the entire work environment in a, like a one meter space around the operator and to keep them so that they don't go having to wander around and find stuff. Again, when I, when I was a young employee and you'd spend some time in the shop, you'd be like, oh yeah, right, I'm missing this tool. I have to wander away. I have to go over here and find stuff. So the first goal is keep everything in, in, in a you know, meter around them, you know, literally an arm's reach. And then they are uh, running, and cross training is huge because people are gonna get bored out of their mind if they do the same thing every day. But uh, you, know, you could be making, uh, a boat, you could be making an engine for a boat, you could be making an electric drive, which are kind of cool. You could be making trucks, RVs, think of all the things that you use every day. Um, somebody put that together. It doesn't, you know, we don't, we don't have like little grow formula that you, you kind of put, sprinkle water on it and an RV grows. There's people doing cabinet work and it's cool to see things that you, that you touch become things, become things. So what I'm hearing you say is the people who do stuff operate within a, you know, within like a one meter space. In other words, not much bigger than the size of a cubicle, folks. <laughs> and yeah, a, lot more, a lot more active, actually. Excuse me? A lot more active. Cubicles, cubicles that kill you, actually. You know, you just... Yeah, versus uh, in a plant, you're able to move a little bit uh, and you do stuff. So your arms are in motion versus you're typing away. Uh, and thus, they, you know, there's variety potentially in the work that they do. Um, it may not be every day that they switch to something else, but they switch with some some regularity. Am I hearing that correctly? We you intent, most. I want again. I always want to be careful because, uh, and again, I'm looking at my stats. There are like 250,000 manufacturers in the U.S. A lot of them are small, right? But in general, you, you try to keep your folks happy and you try to rotate them around because if you're the only person that knows something, the day you're homesick or you're, you take a day off, the entire factory stops running is not a very bright move. So you cross train people, but uh, people, but, and again, I say that carefully because some people absolutely love doing that, that sense of stability. Factory folks, people like me are gonna try to drive people to cross train. It isn't the other way around. A lot of people think, you know, you, you just want to have me make one widget all day long. I really want people to learn a lot of things because the other thing is if you work the process up ahead of you and, be, and down below you, you're going to have a sense of, well, when I do something, how does it impact the rest of the team? And if you're all by yourself, you, you, you just in isolation. So you are correct. We try to cross train, bring some variety in. It's also exciting, by the way, is to try new things, try different things. Agreed. And thus, when you were hiring, when you were in manufacturing, how did you evaluate people to bring them on board? Was it skills-based? Like, how did you evaluate the talent in order to see whether you'd want to hire them? Well, you know, there are big companies, right? Big companies, there's the screening interviews, right? So they're background checking and they're, they're checking for, you know, simple, some basic aptitudes, right? As, you know, math, uh, not a terrible amount of math, but you, you know, there are aptitude tests you gotta get through, uh, drug screen, uh, and you'd be amazed how many folks don't make it through those screens. Uh, once you get them through the screening, it's really is an issue of, I just love good attitude, right? It's, um, you think about it, there's very few folks that if, if you really are open-minded and, and there's challenges, you know, right now you read in the newspaper where people are talking about, you know, hey, uh, there's not enough workers and hey, we need to do things. There weren't a lot of workers in 2017, 2018, 2019. You know, we had challenges on uh, available people, available jobs was pretty close. I mean, it was like a one for one ratio. You didn't have like four people lining up on a job. So you look for good attitude and then you just have to assume you're gonna train people. You're not gonna find people like fall off the, off the, like, a, off a, like a piece of fruit off a tree that knows how to run a million dollar machine tool. It's funny when you talk about attitude. I was listening to a podcast interview with a guy who started 1-800-JUNK. And he was a college student and he saw a guy, well, he was in McDonald's in Canada, uh, who had a sign on the side of his truck about how he holds stuff away. 
And out of that, he had an idea for a business. So he himself bought a truck for $734, he says. And as he started to grow the business, he had like five trucks and 11 people and then realized he didn't like the attitude of the people that were working for him. And came to the decision he needed to replace all of them. And he's built his business. There's a lot of variables that go into this, obviously. But part of this is finding happy people, finding people with an attitude where they seem engaged in what they're doing. And you and I both know how limited employee engagement is in the United States these days. Despite all the information we have about how to have an engaged workforce, it's very, very limited. So... I'm sorry. It looked like I was I was interrupting you on a thought there. <laughs> You're just fine. But uh, the, the but it, it's reciprocal. You know, it, it works back and forth, right? Because your attitude, if if we're working together, your the team attitude impacts you. Uh, the senior leadership impacts you. You know, so we kind of feed off of each other. So if you you get kind of a positive vibe going, you want to keep it going. But uh, so. And I want to be careful, you know, just because somebody's cheerful, you know, it's, it's how do you engage them, right? It's not just about kind of blindly being happy. It's how do you tie them to a bigger purpose? Um, because if you don't want it to be just a job. You want people to actually understand what they do is important and how it all ties together, right? You, you ever, ever, have you read a book by a guy named Pat Lencioni? Wrote a, it's been renamed a couple of times, but it was one time it was called The Three, uh, Three Fables of a Miserable Job. And he said, no, I haven't read that one. Break any, any one of the three things people need for a job to be pretty cool is it's got to be measurable. He does them opposite. It's like, hey, for the, it's miserable because it's Im, immeasurable. It's insignificant. It's irrelevant. But, you know, I'll, I'll have somebody come in and they say, I, I just hate what I'm doing or I hate who I'm working for. And I say, okay, hey, let's do the little triangle. Which of the three is out of balance? Can you measure what you do? I worked, I worked at a zoo for high school and college. I worked at the Milwaukee zoo, uh, taking, taking admission tickets. We measured, you know, you knew how many cars you did, you know, how much money you took in on your till. And you knew if somebody was slacking because we measured, you know, we just measured it. Uh, waitresses, people work through like drive throughs They'll measure how many times they can make somebody smile. They, you make things up if you don't have things to measure. Relevance and significance. Does my boss actually know who I am? I had a young guy who used to work for me. He, he, his guy, and I was talking to his, the guys who work for him, and he, they're like, he calls us dude. I said, why do you think he calls you dude? He's like, because he doesn't know our names. And I'm like, so I quiz him. I was like, hey, the guy who's in the first station, what's the guy's name? Well, that dude is, you know, he told me, I'm like, no, what's, what's his name? And then significance is, you know, picture if I paid you to sort like paper clips and, I, and you put it in a box at the end of the day, and then I took that box and I paid you like a dollar paperclip for sorting. Made amazing my money. Then I took that thing and just dumped it back in the bin. It would kill you. You wouldn't do it. You know, it's crazy. You would take that money and go do something else. You'd squirrel the money away. As soon as you could run away, you'd go away. So make it measurable, make it significant, and make it relevant. Right? And, and most, somebody if, a, if a person's trying to find a job in manufacturing, like they're not in the field whatsoever, Maybe they're that student who's coming out of school now who is not cut out for the office. Uh, and they've decided manufacturing might be a thing that they should try. What do they need to know coming in? And do you have recommendations for how they might find a job in manufacturing? Well, a couple of places to start, right? One is um, and, and, you know, these have different names in different parts of the country, right? You could talk community college, vocational college, trade school, um, some basic skill because, you know, the other thing, you know, so that's one place, right, is get some feel for it. Hey, uh, you know, I'd like to, you know, maybe I take a machining class and, and usually those, the trade school votex and things are pretty affordable and you get a good sense of it. That's a path. The other one is most communities have in some form a workforce center. You know, it's usually a joint venture between the Department of Labor, uh, local community, and local community, you know, uh, Department of Labor and the community colleges. I stop in there and I just uh, find out, hey, who's interviewing for jobs? Who's got jobs out there? Who's looking for people? And uh, who's good to work for? 
because again, 250,000 manufacturers, not all of us are, are angels. Not all of us are, not all of us are equally good. Um, and I just ask around. Uh, I'll tell you the labor, the talent needs are so high that people are going to take a shot at somebody who's energetic, who shows up, you know, who seems, seems fairly diligent. And there's a lot of people that college isn't for them, right? It, it's not what they're wired to be. And, uh, but I, I just say you, you can go, but I started the workforce center because they usually aggregate jobs and they can, if they like you, you know, again, to know them a little bit, they'll kind of refer you over. Hey, so-and-so is hiring. So-and-so needs some people. They're looking for good talent. They're, they're taking entry level people. And then I door knock, you know, I do the, the virtual door knocking, right? Which is apply online, job fair online. Um, Northern Wisconsin, a lot of companies are starting programs. There's a, there's a program called, and it's all one word, move to manufacturing.com move to manufacturing.com because they're trying to attract people to try out some of the virtual stuff and then kind of work their way into some training. And then if they, you kind of work through the virtual training, they'll pay you 500 bucks to take a job, take an interview. with them. I know in my area in Western North Carolina, there are manufacturers who start off by having high school students do internships with them and they send vehicles out to pick them up after school and they're paying them. And they're training them and they're trying to see the reliability for meeting the van uh, that's picking them up. They're trying to observe their behavior while they're in. And at the end of their senior year, they're offering jobs at above minimum wage levels because they've already trained in how they operate and they have a sense of how they work. Um, I've seen everything. I've worked the food chain all the way to middle school. I mean, I would send people out to do junior achievement, right? You know, if, you're, if you work for me as a supervisor, you know, team lead, you know, like, hey, I'd like to do junior achievement. I'd be like, you go for it. Hey, you wanna do a, you wanna do a class talk, you know? Hey, let's bring the kids through a tour. Now in our, our factories, you had to be 18 years old to work in the shop. You could be a high schooler and you could do data entry. You could do, um, you know, some like programming troubleshooting. I mean, it seems crazy. I like a 16 year old is doing like, uh, uh, test parameter analysis. That's that's cool. You cannot work on our shop floors below eight uh, be, before you turn 18. But again, I'd, I'd work the food chain all the way up to, you know, we do a lot of open houses. A lot of times we'll do like family day. Is the draw people in? We do in, employee referrals. I'd love to empi- employ somebody's kid um, because I just want to get them in the door. And again, there's nothing better. You know, actually when I, like as a consultant, what I'll do is I'll tour somebody and they say, well, I can't get any people. Hey, do you do an employee referral? And they're like, yeah, that, that doesn't work. And I'm like, well, maybe that's an indication of the problem you have is because you're going to pay a lot of money for advertising, but your own employees don't recommend you. Maybe, maybe that's a starting place is what do you need to do to win the ones you already have over? And thus I'm wondering whether, the easy way to get in is just getting a referral from someone who works at a facility. I'd start, you know, again, I'd start, I, you know, there's, it is not hard to get your foot, you know, like get somebody to talk to you. If you know somebody who's like works at a, uh, say a, a Winnebago RV or a, you know, a, a Brunswick boat factory, and you know your neighbor fairly well, say, hey, does anybody hire you? I love a referral, you know, uh, you know can, I, can I reach out to the HR people? And they'll say, hey, reach out online. And then hey, in the spot, could you just put me as a referral? Sure. Yeah. Knowing something on the way in about what the job is. Now we've spoken about ways to get training at Votech schools, vocational tech folks, uh, community colleges, some version of a, of a school or a training program that might be available locally. And what are they getting trained in? And many of these programs depends what you do right you know some it depends how you're wired right so some of it could be electronic troubleshooting you know like maintenance you know you, you, the thing people say well you know all the stuff's going to automate um i was at a client not too long back and they were like we, we just want to buy a robot and i'm like what are you gonna do with your robot well we can't get people and i'm like well if you think the robot is you know they're not service free you know you, you've got to program them you got to service them you got to keep them running yeah, you might replace a few people on the shop floor, but you need to think through, well, how are you going to keep the thing running? So again, training programs, robot techs, uh, technology controllers, you know, you think of all the electronics inside a, mach- inside a machine tool, you know, in a processing piece of equipment. There's tremendous opportunity for people who love electronics, who love programming. 
And so you could start there. Some people love the well. Uh, again, I'll tell you, if I had, if I had a, if I had a, and my son, neither of my kids, none, none of my three kids like the weld. If they could weld, if they like to weld, you could, you could make a gob of money as a welder right off the bat. Like what's a gob of money for oh, a welder? Welders, welders, you could start easily 25, 30 bucks an hour as a welder because they, and the other thing is if we had an aptitude for it, it was just like, Hey, I took a class in college or college. I took a class in high school. Uh, you know, I went, I went nights, I took a night class in welding. Um, they're hard to come by. But again, again, part of it is people associate it with, it's a different, it's a different theme. It's a different style. It's a different, you know, because you, you, you do wear a helmet, you, you do deal, you know, we talk chasing the, chasing the light bulb, right? Because when you get the, you get the, the black glass on, you're seeing a light, you're kind of chase the light. Um, it's a different style, but some people just love it. And a lot of farm kits, you know, again, that's why you find a lot of factories grew up around farms because off season, you know, it's kind of sometimes manufacturing be a little cyclical. Farm kit is just great. And I mean, farm, farm kit is girl or boy. Um, they just like the work and a lot of them learned how to weld on the farm. Now you mentioned the job called robot tech or robotech. What do they do? What do they uh, They can do need to know. program a robot? Because, you know, you think about it, it's like, hey, I got this thing that's, good. you know, I got a robot, it picks up a part, it puts the part over there. It uh, puts in a, you know, we'll, we'll make it like, a, like an engineering joke. I screw in light bulbs with a robot. Um, they don't come out of the box knowing how to do that. So somebody has to teach a robot how to do it. Now, that can be done offline through off what's called offline programming, which is I've created a virtual I, like my office, I created a virtual office with a virtual light fixture with a virtual light bulb and I got a virtual robot and that, you know, I program it there. Then I take it to the shop floor and I rerun the program. You can also do what's called the teach pendant, which is I've got a, a teach little, one? Like, teach pendant. It looks just like, like a joystick and a little pro, you know, like a calculator mm -hmm. cross with a joystick and I can program a robot using the joystick and the, and the thing, but somebody's got to teach them how to do it. So that's one form of robot technician. The other one is, Somebody's got to service the little bugger because over time, you know, you know, like like as we get older, our joints get a little bit out of kilter. Never happened to me. We're not we're not quite as flexible as we used to be. We need a little bit of work. Um, somebody's got to keep those things running correctly. And there's a lot of variety in the factory. You know, again, think about it like when we as consumers go to a someplace, we like. We don't want just the, you know, Henry Ford joke about the black car. I, I want different colors. I want different styling. I want different stuff. Um, robots have to program, you know, if you're programming robots and then service them, you, they have to go through a lot of different variation to be able to, to kind of do their job. And it's not going to displace all the people in the world. There's, there's lots of jobs going to happen because of uh, automation. It's funny, when I think about that description as you gave it, I tend to think of that as being something with the vendor who's selling that service because it's got to be put in in the manufacturing plan and they can say, no, we do some basic work here to set up and then after that, bye, uh, unless you buy a service contract in some way. And what I'm hearing you say, that isn't the case. I'm hearing you say there's someone on the machine floor who's doing it. There, there's, a, there's combinations, right? You know, again, depends on, you know, if, if for any reason, if I'm a really small shop, I may pay the service contract. I may pay somebody, you know, hey, would you come back around and things like that. But in general, bigger shop, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy, you know, I buy an automation system. I'm going to buy so many hours of, 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 of transition to production. But then I also I bought X amount of training because I, I, I want to be self self-sufficient, right? I don't want to have a facility where, okay, my robot just decided to stop running. My, I bought him from somebody in, you know, like you're in Western, in the Western Carolinas. Maybe my, my supplier was in Georgia. Okay, now I've got to wait for them to drive from Atlanta. Um, once I get a hold of them, I actually need service now, right? So having the ability to control my own destiny is good, right? But again, that's another place where people, when you talk about having jobs in manufacturing, people who design automation systems, it's a pretty good gig. You know, you're designing crazy stuff, things that lift, you know, rocket nozzles and machining rocket nozzles. Because you have things like SpaceX and all those things, those are all those components, somebody's making those things. And a lot of them are handled by robots and, you know, just orient them because they're so big, right? You know, somebody's going to turn them, flip them, 
and somebody's programmed and designed those systems, which is really cool. How much do those people make? Uh, Range, obviously. A good, see, a good, we're talking automation kind of yes. technician. A good automation technician could be 50 to 75 bucks an hour. I mean, they're, they're doing fine. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, uh, and you can't find them. I mean, they're hard to come by. I mean, again, I, I just chatted with somebody who was, again, looking for, um, you know, somebody, you know, kind of to come on their team because they need it. And they have a large team, but they wanted more technicians, you know, people who are proficient in automation technician, you know, because in a sense, you're a mechanic because you know how to, the mechanical stuff runs. You've got a little bit of plumbing in you because a lot of them are hydraulic, you know, they're hydraulic fluid moving the, moving the parts around. And you're an electrician and you're kind of paying for all three. Electro hydraulic uh, electri uh, electrical technician. Interesting. And that's once someone's in one of these jobs, how do they progress professionally? Well, it, it, it depends, right? And I, I don't want to keep giving you the depends answer, but it, it matters how they're wired. Um, some become, you know, say I come in and I'm a part of a team, so I might be part of a unit of, you know, five, maybe there's five, six of us on, on a given team. This is, uh, I might become a team lead. I might, because the technology keeps changing enough, um, I might, it's like a school teacher. I might stay, you know, I might teach third grade math one year. I might teach fourth grade math the next year. I might teach social studies one year. So some technicians just love, you know, they make good money and they stay in the technology realm. They just move around between different types of things they want to master and they want to pick up. Other folks kind of like the, the lead thing. They like being lead. They like having the responsibility of coordinating other people. A lot of technical people like to have, you know, they, I don't necessarily, I'm the Achilles heel, the heel of, mo, of, not, of many like, of technician type folks is a, a perfectionist tendencies, which makes, that makes them hard to be supervisor because they just want to do everything, right? And then from there, you could go maybe sales lead. Some people are pre-implementation leads. You know, they're kind of going to doing a customer. They're doing an evaluation. They're doing design work. They come back, work with the team. Some people are post-implementation support where you talked about, hey, uh, you know, I've got to get the thing up and running. I like to be on the road. Uh, I'll, I'll hang out at a, at a job site for three months while they come up in the production, and then I'll move to another site. But it's all different temp temperaments and personalities, but really some exciting kind of stuff going on. Um. What kind of exciting stuff is going on? Well, I mean, look at look at the look at the, look at electric cars. My gosh, um, like you know, electrification of everything. Um, you've got people doing private private uh, private rocket companies. Who would have thought of like SpaceX ten years ago? Um, you've got Bezos with his own kind of thing about to go off in the space for eleven minutes. Somebody's building all that stuff. Um, you look at look at just the you know the, you, what we you hear people talk about like the uh, industry 4.0 the Internet of Things <coughs> the amount of uh, computer firepower showing up just in your own phone right you know think of all the things your phone can do uh, factories are you know are those is that technology on steroids so you've got the ability to machine things you never thought before and now you get into like additive manufacturing right which is you say what additive manufacturing 3D printing right. I can, I can now create stuff that I never imagined uh, because I used to have to remove material. Additive means I build it upwards, I print it, and I can do stuff. Not, like I said, a nozzle on a rocket is 3D printed. A lot of them are printed in titanium and then machined. There are, it, it is unlimited, the things you can create these days. So what I'm hearing is 3D printing is one of those things. Like I, I've been looking at 3D printing a house behind mine, because uh, I've got the land for it. And well, if you, if you kind of Google the NASA challenge, you know, one of the NASA challenges that some of the companies have been taking on is 3D printing, like housing for Mars, where you literally can, you land, you land the, the craft, it manufactures its own concrete on site, and they 3D, you know, it's essentially like a fire hose, and they 3D print the, the enclosures. Fabulous. But, yeah. It's, I actually own two 3D printers myself, so I mean. Ooh, we'll talk about that one later. <laughs> we can talk about that later. But it's, there's interesting things to, I mean, it's, it's affordable at an at a, at a individual level, which is crazy. Yeah, that's fabulous. So what haven't we covered yet that we really should to give people a picture of manufacturing? Well, the other thing, you know, we're talking entry-level jobs. I mean, there's, 
there's talent to be had all the way through the food chain, right? You know, it's, um, I think a lot of military folks, right? People who are coming off deployment and things. It's, they make wonderful supervisors, right? And you talk to somebody who's post-military and what do they miss? They miss camaraderie. They miss being part of something of significance. They need, they need a home. Check out manufacturing, right? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks come out of uh, the military. Uh, their MOSs don't match. You know, maybe I was like a tank mechanic. It doesn't match a, a, a skill set that, uh, that the industry needs. Retool. You know, there are a lot of, lot of uh, funding available to help, uh, you know, military people transition skill sets into machining, assembly, welding, um, technician support, but then supervision, area supervision, these are all scales. You know, as, as we look, to, as we look to, to jobs coming, you know, be basically home sourcing, you know, coming from China, coming from Asia, coming this way, um, we're adding a lot of manufacturing folks at the, at the shop level, but they're, and I don't, it's not so much supervision as it is helping people resolve issues that keep them productive, right? It's not about correcting Jeff's behavior it's about, hey, problem solving to figure out, well, why isn't this producing exactly the way it's supposed to? And uh, all the way to area managers, the plant managers, to uh, operations directors and VPs. I mean, there's a whole pipeline of opportunity. It's what I refer to as eliminating friction. Yeah, and it isn't, it isn't I mean, there is some of that. Uh, the workforce today has, has got some challenges. You know, I, I, I don't, Jeff, I think we, we talked to one time before the call that when I, when I hired in, you know, you'd see like a high school kid, kid came into a factory and they got kind of corrupted, right? They learned bad language, you know, same thing in the military. They kind of went in the military and they learned bad language. And then we'd come home and leave or like with us, they'd go home for, you know, the after work and they'd maybe say foul words. Um, today, 30, 30, 40 years later, Kids come in from high school, we have to detox them from saying stuff that will get them fired in the workforce. You know, it's like, they, some kids, and I would say a lot of kids, their, their natural interaction with each other in the high school setting is a lot rougher than it is in a factory setting. A lot more inappropriate things get said in, in the high school setting than ever would be said today in a factory setting. So we, we do have to have some degree of nurturing and and structure and, and I use the word love, you know, really is uh, how do you bond somebody in? Because there's no perfect employee. You know, if I'm a fact, if I'm a plant manager, I think everybody I'm gonna hire is gonna be perfect. I'm gonna be just disappointed a lot. Um, I do need to acclimate people into, into the workplace. Excellent. And thus recommending, you know, if you're a parent who's talking to your son or daughter about manufacturing as a possibility, what should they be you know, keeping an eye out for behaviorally or interest-wise that might cause them to bring up the conversations. It's, it's not something that a lot of high schools or, for that matter, colleges are going to have the conversation about. How might that conversation get launched? And what might well, they bring up? I think people should just explore things. You know, it's a crazy thing. Like, again, if, if, you know, Jeff, I don't know if you're, if you bought, uh, I think it was like, Bowling Green used to, I think Bowling Green, Kentucky used to make, what, the Corvette, Camaro? I know I'm mixing and matching. You used to be able to go visit your car, right? Um, take a tour. You know, kids tour colleges all the time. Go tour a factory. I mean, post-COVID, you know, but it's coming quick. I mean, things are opening up. Um, I, I think like RV manufacturers, you know, you're paying hundred and some thousand bucks, 150,000 bucks for a for your RV, a lot of them used to let you come visit your RV while it was being made. Um, so they actually are wired for tours. You know, Caterpillar was, uh, John Deere was, and Polaris. Call them, call them up and again, post COVID, you know, let's, let's wait a little bit, but, and say, hey, do you guys do public tours? I'd love to come through and just take a look at things because things really have changed over 30 years, 40 years. And you can just kind of see if kids, you know, your, your kid kind of groups on it. You know, you, you'll think about it, you'll drive all over the country to take your kid to a college to check it out. Check out a couple of factories. Check out, the, and the other thing, community colleges, check those up because there's some really neat programs going on in community colleges. Because again, where do we get our talent and where do we do some early feeding? We do it there. Excellent. Jim, how can people find out more about you and the work that you do? So again, if they want to learn more about me and my company, it, it's... And I, and I was really, 
I focus on the word integrity. So it's integris 360 leadership, right? Because we, we kind of incorporate, it's not, there's no easy solution. So you can check out I for integris, i360l.com and just check out the website or, and I would love, I'm an open networker. I'd love to meet people on, on LinkedIn. You can check me out at LinkedIn. It's, you know, linkedin.in slash Jim Rink. Um, there are a number of us, by the way. So, but, uh, and I mentioned- But you got the name. I got it first. But uh, <laughs> you, you, if you Google me, you will find some very eclectic Jim Rinks in the world. And I'd like to be part of them. <laughs> Jim, thank you. And folks, we'll be back soon with more. I'm Jeff Altman, The Big Game Hunter. Hope you enjoyed today's show. If you're watching on YouTube, Click the like button, share it, do something that lets people know that you enjoyed it and found that it was worthwhile. Also want to encourage you, if you're listening to the podcast, share that too. Again, the more that people discover my content, it helps that much, many more people. Also, I mentioned my website, thebiggamehunter.us has thousands of posts that will help you with a job search, hiring more effectively, managing and leading and resolving workplace related issues, all in the context of trying to have you enjoy your life, including your professional life as well. I've got my own LinkedIn profile at linkedin.com forward slash high end forward slash the big game hunter. Mention that you saw the interview. I like knowing I'm helping folks and, uh, Again, at my website, there's a ton of great information, services I have available. I'll, you can schedule time for a free discovery call, find out about my video courses, and much, much more. Hope you have a terrific day, and most importantly, be great. Take care.